Hello and welcome to our talk, New Slide Attacks on Almost Self-Similar Ciphers. I'm Or Dunkelman and this is a joint work with Nathan Keller, Noam Lastri, and Adi Shami. So we're going to start with a quick introduction and recapping of the slide attacks. Um, and especially we will discuss the issue of generating these slip pairs. After we discuss this, we're going to move on to mention several applications of slide attacks and we will mention that Due to generation of slip pair issues, most of the attacks are actually against facial constructions. And then we're going to discuss how to attack uh, self-similar SP networks. And specifically, we'll start with 1K AES, which is a generalization of uh, AES with in the, in infinite number of rounds, where the same subkey is used in all the rounds. And we'll see a Baron et al. attack from 2018, how to break such a cipher. Then we're going to discuss what is the problem of applying a slide attack to SP networks? And specifically, uh, there are two problems. First of all, is a generic due to the last round uh, key addition. And then we're going to discuss uh, ciphers, SP networks such as AS, which have a very different or slightly different uh, last round, which already poses a lot of problems to slide attacks, which are very much dependent of having self similarity, similarity all through the rounds. To solve these issues, we're going to introduce four new techniques. The first one is slit sets, where instead of sliding only pairs, we're sliding sets of plain texts. Then we will show the hypercube of slit pairs, which is actually a way to take several slit pairs, which were built in a specific manner, and make them into many other slit pairs. So you get a hypercube. And then we're going to discuss two more techniques. The first one is the suggestive plain text structures. And in the suggestive plain text structures, what happens is instead of having to guess which are the slit pairs, we work with a slightly different approach where once you work with a plain text, you automatically get some of the keying material. We will see this later. And at the end, the substitution slide attack, which involves a lot of playing with arguments to make the attack even uh, faster, specifically for the case of 1K AES, we're able to attack it using two to the n over two known plain text, meaning we need one slit pair for the attack to work, but using two to the three over four n time, which is significantly better than the trivial, let's try all two to the n pairs and see whether which of them is indeed a slit pair. So the slide attacks were introduced in 1999 by Birokov and Wagner, and these are adaptation of the related key attacks uh, introduced by BM in 93 and Knudsen in 92 to the case where the key schedule generates self-related keys specifically. Assume for a second that the key schedule is such that the key is the same in all the rounds. If this is the case, then if the plain text P is encrypted to the intermediate encryption value Q after one round, then this Q and another plain text Q can develop together through the encryption function. Because if the value key Q here is equal to the value Q here, and this is exactly the same function, then these two values are going to be the same. And if these two values are going to be the same, and this is exactly the same function, again, the same key, therefore, these two values are the same. And this continues all the way through until the ciphertext C, which is equal to the value here. Now, do know that this thing is independent in the number of rounds. Actually, Having more rounds here in between doesn't change this property, which has a very nice uh, implication, meaning that slide attacks usually can break uh, any number of rounds. And at the end, we have here another round because P was encrypted one round to Q. That means that the number of rounds here and the number of rounds here is the same, meaning there is still one last round needed here. So a slit pair is actually a pair that P becomes Q after one round, and such a pair actually satisfies these two conditions. Q is equal to the encryption of P and D is equal to the encryption of C, but through only one round. Now, as you probably know, we're using many rounds because of the diffusion and confusion approach, or if you want to make things harder and more complicated. That means that breaking a single round is expected to be significantly simpler than breaking the entire scheme, especially as the scheme can has can have as many rounds as you want, because as I mentioned before, the attack is independent in the number of rounds. So how the attack works? First of all, we need to find such a slit pair, 
P and Q such that they satisfy this relation, we get this relation for free. And then we try to break f of k, the round function, using the slip pair, we find the key. Now there is only one problem. In most of the attacks that work using slide attacks, what happens is that you take a pair that you don't know whether it's a slip pair or not, you extract the key, then you verify the key, and then you know that you found the slip pair, so you know that you found the key. So if you look at it very carefully, you will notice that in, in order to attack the scheme, we first of all need to find the slip pair, but to find the slip pair, we need to find the key. And we know that we found the right key only if we found the slip pair. So there is some internal loop there. And this is why many techniques were developed in order to mitigate this problem. And most of them work mostly for facials. And this is the um, reason mostly facials are attacked using slide attack. Now, how do you generate these slip pairs? So the worst case, let's assume that you have n bit block. What you can do is to pick two to the n over two non plaintext. Now, throughout the talk, uh, I'm going to disregard small factors. Of course, they are in the paper, we need to be accurate. So if you pick two to the n over two non plaintext, you expect to find one slit pair with very high probability, 63%. Again, exact details are in the paper. Now, Again, that means that there are two to the n pairs. So we need a way to find which is the correct pair or which is the slip pair actually. And for facials, you can find such pairs in more efficient ways. For example, for the 1K DS, which is a generic uh, DES construction, generic facial construction, you have the same key going in all the rounds. You can do this using two to the n over four chosen plain text. And this is already in the original paper by uh, Buryakov and Wagner. Now for 2K DES, where you have K1, K2, K1, K2, K1, K2 uh, interleaved, then you need the more advanced techniques such as slide with a twist or the complementation slide. And then you can do it in two to the n over four chosen plain texts or chosen ciphertext. And you can even attack 4K DES using two to the n over four chosen plain text and ciphertext in a way that combines both the slide with a twist and the complementation property. These are from the advanced slide attacks paper by Bureau and Wagner from 2000. So this is how you generate these slip pairs usually. And of course, there is another technique which is due to Fourier uh, from 2001. Actually given a slit pair, P and Q and their ciphertext, C and D, they are also one round apart. Meaning, let's go back here. What happens if I look at C and D as the new plaintext? C after one round of encryption, will become D, meaning that if I continue to encrypt C and D, C after one round, which becomes D and D, they will continue together, meaning at the end, they are again going to satisfy the condition that they have the same value here. And because we have the same keys all around here, we're going to, same, to get the same value here. And because it's the same value here, again, we're going to get a slip pair. And actually, Faruya noticed that you can iterate this as many times as you want to generate a slip chain. Now, the advantage of this slit chain concept is the fact that now we don't need to attack the round function using only two plaintexts. Now, you say, okay, now I have two known plaintexts here because we don't control uh, P and Q. They're, they're a slit pair. We, we don't control their values. So if the round function is significantly weak and we can break it using two known plaintexts, then you just apply the slide attack. But sometimes you need more data. And this is why we need this uh, trick of slit chains in order to generate more inputs to the round function. So if something is a slit pair, then automatically you get a, slide, a slit chain, which is very useful. One uh, small technical comment, this is, makes the attack a chosen plain text, adaptive chosen plain text and ciphertext attack. Uh, some people are less likely to use it. Now, there are other techniques and generalizations. For example, uh, in 2007, we had a paper about uh, detecting cycle, the, the sleepers using cycles, which can become into a quantum settings as well. The recent work from Crypto 18. There are the reflections attack, the reflection attack by Cara, uh, Cara from 2008, and there is the slide text attack, and there are several other attacks that use that. So the slide attack is actually very useful, and besides playing around with permutations, it can be used to attack 
artificial constructions like 1K DES or 2K DES or 4K DES, but actually there is a MISTI attack on MISTI-1 uh, from 2015. Uh, Kilok, many of the attacks actually start with a slight attack, um, including the paper from Europe 2008. And even several attacks against the format preserving cipher, FF3, they start with finding a slide. Now, there, there is a related tweak there, but at the end, this is a slide attack that reduces the problem of breaking eight rounds of a cipher with pseudo random function as a round function into breaking only four rounds. And this is a huge advantage, as we, you all know, eight rounds are significantly harder to break than four, especially in the case of Facetals, which we know due to Lubir and Rakor that eight rounds is very hard and four rounds is slightly less hard. So here's the generic uh, case we're going to discuss, which is 1K AES, a generic SPN. We have a plain text. First of all, there is a key addition, S-box layer, a fine layer, key addition, S-box addition, uh, fine layer, et cetera, et cetera. And here at the end, we have another key addition because at the end, if there was no such a key addition, I could always take the ciphertext and go backwards until the point of the last key addition. So in any case, even if the cipher doesn't have this key addition layer, I can, all, I can always remove all the non-keyed uh, components to get into the last round, which is XOR with the key. Um, and if, if this is the case, let's look at the case of a slit pair here. If P becomes Q at this point, if they satisfy this relation, then I can write, rewrite the equation Q, which is the application of K on P and then S and then A into P X or K, which is that part. And because uh, S and A are unkeyed, I can always take the values here and go backwards until this point. So I get a very simple uh, mechanism. I can just take all the plain texts here in advance and just go backwards. And generally speaking, we will usually do this trick. We will move plain text and ciphertext as much as we can until we reach something which is keyed and we can't do this trick anymore. Now, here is the attack by uh, Baron et al. Take two to the n over two known plain texts. Um, take a slit pair will satisfy two conditions. First of all, this is the condition from the plain text side, but from the ciphertext side, you have something which is slightly different and we'll see it in a second. Um, but if you write the equation correctly, what happens is that you apply S on C, then A, and then you X or K. So if you can see, you can extract here K from both equations and you get P X or K, uh, Q prime is equal to K, which is also D X or A of S of C. Um, what, what happens here in order to identify the uh, right key, you move, so the problem is that trying all possible pairs is very time consuming because you have two to the end pairs. So what you do, you just uh, change uh, sides and you move Q prime here and then you move uh, A, S, S of C here and then you get one side which depends only on the plaintext and ciphertext and the other one which depends on the other plaintext and the other ciphertext. So, and both of them are equal, equal so you can use hash tables to immediately identify when this happens, when P X or that equals to Q prime X or that. So, and, and Q prime is just moving again all the, applying all the functions that we can. So as you can see, this is a very simple uh, attack. It takes two to the n over two known plaintext because each side is analyzed once. You just put everything in the hash table. It takes also time two to the n over two, uh, time and memory. Now, the Baron et al paper had a few other attacks which are based on slit chains. And there is a basic assumption in slide attacks that all the round functions are the same. Now, unfortunately, this is not the case for SPN networks. And the reason is that the last round is different. Even in a generic SP network, not AS, which we'll discuss in a second, but in a generic SP network, the last round behaves slightly differently. And specifically, let's look at P and Q. P was encrypted to C, and I, this is how the equations uh, connecting C and D happens. So now C and D are slid, but let's look at what happens when you try to encrypt C and D. C will first be XORed with K. Now, in this data path, C was first 
altered by applying S. So actually, if this XOR cancels this XOR, because this is the same key, what happens is that D, the value D here is K XOR A on S on X, XOR K. However, the value here is A after one round of encrypting C is A of S of X. With very high probability, these two values are not the same. And if this is indeed the case, then of course the chains will not continue. So any attack which is based on building slit chains, and these are some of the attacks in Baron et al. paper, will not work. Now, in the case of AES, we have another problem, is and is it that, that in AES then there is no mixed columns in the last round? Actually, in many SP networks, the last round is different. Not only that we have an XOR, an additional XOR, which actually changes everything, the affine transformation is different because now the relation between plaintext and ciphertext is significantly harder. So let's think that we have AES, not 1K AES as in generic SP network, but 1K AES as AES. So if, for example, Q and P are slit pairs, their ciphertexts do not have DNC do not have a simple relation. They have this XR K, mixed column, add round key, subbytes, shifters, add round key. These are two different relations. This is not the case like we have in faceless and regular slide attacks, which causes a lot of uh, problems in attacks, as we will see later. So we have these two problems, which relate very strongly to the fact that the last round behaves differently. And this is why we need other techniques to generate more slit pairs out of a single slit pair. And, and, and this is at the end, the, the, the key technique which is used in three out of the four attacks that we're going to present today is that we find new methods of transforming a single slit pair into many slit pairs. The first one is the slit sets. Slit sets actually take two lambda structures. In a second, we'll remind everyone what lambda structures are, P and Q. And we actually work with sets such that one set is the encryption after one round of the other. Now, if this is the case, and because this is a lambda set, it saturates in a second again, it saturates all over all the inputs to some specific S box, we are going to get two to the S slit pairs. Now, we may not know which value goes with which value inside the sets. However, it will be very easy to identify which set goes which is with which set and then solving exactly what is the or internal ordering is very simple now because we have better signal we can go back and attack schemes now i'm going to to show mostly how we attack 1k aes for simplicity in the paper we show that we can break 2k aes and 3k aes whether with full diffusion partial diffusion and there are several uh, attacks also on unknown S boxes, because what happens if the AS has unknown S boxes, if we're discussing something which is similar to a Pataran's 2R system, which is a fine S box, a fine S box, or the S box layer uh, is secret. So what is a Lambda set? So we usually call it a, a square or a saturation or integral. You take a plain text, you fix, uh, 15 out of the 16 S boxes in the case of AES, or as many, all S boxes but one, and you try all possible inputs to this, this S box. Now, this is a set, one set, and we need to pick many such sets. Now, uh, we also take the second set, which is the slid version. Now, what we do, we take Q, which is the plain text, which is the slid and we move it backwards through all the unkeyed values. And then we just want to make sure that the set is defined that we still get a lambda set. So what happens is that we take values that are in, not in the fine subspace, this is in the fine subspace, this is not in the fine subspace, but actually if you apply this on all the values in the specific set, you get also a lambda set. Now, why is that? Because 
if by any chance the other, the non-saturated bytes, the non-saturated part of the plain text, happens to become the non-saturated part of the this set, these are actually slit sets. And this is, we change the meaning of the slit set because of course, due to the saturation, each plain text from this set will have a corresponding value in this set, as long as the other uh, fixed uh, parts also encrypt correctly, meaning that the part of the non-active S boxes here becomes equal to the non-active S boxes here after the key addition. Now we ask for the for the encryption of the second sets, and then we try to find a slit set. And now I remind you that we have many slit pairs. So if PI and QJ are indeed slit sets, we're going to have many slit uh, pairs between CI and DJ. So here's how the attack works. First of all, we move forward. You see, we apply S on CI and A on the CI. And this is an attack on 2K AS. Just to clarify, we take two rounds of AS. Um, but this is, I could have done also for 1K AS. Now, we do the standard trick of uh, swapping the key and the A addition, the key addition and the fine transformation in the second ciphertext. And for slit set, we get this lovely equation, which is if you apply A minus one on D, on all the ciphertexts in this set, you will get S on this set, X or A of K. Now, if you look very carefully, this means that each of the S boxes is applied independently. The first S box here and the first S box here is independent of the, sec the second S box here and the second S box here. And this helps us in the following fact that instead of trying to guess a key, and now you can say, okay, let's guess a key here and check what happens. It's just that because of the fine transformation on the key, and we don't assume anything on the fine transformation, that means that you need to guess the full key in order to identify the slit pairs, which we don't want. What we do instead, we link the sets without guessing the key, and this is done by uh, counting multipl multiplicities of different values. This is a technique from uh, our paper in Asia Crypt 2010. Uh, what we do, we look, for example, in a specific byte, and in a specific set, we're going to see 100 values which appear once, 98 values which appear twice, and some other distributions. If indeed DJ is a slit set with CI, that, that means that also in the first S box here, we're going to see 100 values that appear only once and 98 values that appear twice. They're not necessarily the same. They are very likely not to be the same because here there is a very, uh, there is a cryptographic transformation, not a strong one, but there is a cryptographic transformation, but the numbers are the same. If we see here, 100 values that appear once, uh, nine, uh, that doesn't, uh, 100 that appear once, 98 that appear, uh, two that appear, not 98 times, 50 times, and 100 values that don't appear at all, then we don't, we have a lot of signal in order to identify whether this set is equal to this set. And you can see in the paper uh, a quick analysis of that fact. Now, this allows us to just take each of the sets CI, analyze it independently of each of the sets DJ, which immediately gives us the slit sets PI and QJ. Now we move on to the next technique, which is hypercube of slit pairs. So what happens again, if we have P and Q, which are a slit pair, and we change the input to, to some S box P um, in the first S box from one value to the other. So instead of having P, we have PX or A, which A activates only one S box. Now, after one round, we have this input difference A becomes some A prime through the S box layer, and there is an affine permutation applied to it, but there are the most two to the S possible values because of the fact that there are two to the S possible A primes. And this is an affine subspace. So if I take P and Q, I can try for given a, all the QJ X or A on A prime, all the possible differences in the same output differences coming from the same S box. And I know that one of them will succeed. So it's probability two to the minus S, I took one slit pair and made it into two. Great. Now, this is a huge success because now we can break the scheme, 
right? Everybody are happy. The thing, the thing is, we can do something even better. Let's assume that for a second that we did this trick twice, meaning we had P and Q, which is a slit pair, and then P store A and Q store A over A prime, we also found out to be a slit pair. Okay, so everybody are happy, and now we have two slit pairs. Now let's assume for a second we got a second one, P X or B and Q X or A of B prime, and A and B are in two different S boxes. So A was, for example, in the first S box, and B was in the second S box. Okay, why, why does it help us? And here is the fun part. If indeed we have this base pair and this friend pair and this friend pair, we can generate another pair which we know is a slit pair for sure, namely P X or A X or B and Q X or A of A prime X or A of B prime is a slit pair as well. Now, of course, if I have more such friend pairs, I can generate a hypercube with more related slit pairs. And this gives us, again, a lot of signal of identifying the right slit pairs. So I'm going to show you how to take one KAS using this technique, uh, and this time with secret S boxes. And I'm going to define it for the parameters of AS just to make life easier. In the description, again, the paper has the full uh, results. So a reminder, we have one KAS, the S box layer is unknown. We know the fine layer uh, for the sake of uh, making things easy. And I'm going to use the AS notations. Um, and this, here's what we do. First of all, we find hypercubes of dimension five, meaning 32 slit pairs. Each slit pair, we generate five other slit pairs each with probability to the minus eight. So we saturate over all these five S boxes. So we have probability of success to the minus 40. But when we succeed, we get 32 slit pairs. Now, what we do, we go into the ciphertext to check whether we indeed got a, a hypercube. And if this is the case, we just need to analyze the input to the add round key and the sub bytes layer. The, Kid S box, and apparently 45 such hypercubes are needed to fully recover the S box. Now, what is observing consistency? For 32 of the slit pairs, because we have a structure of slit pairs, we have different values going into the last round to the unknown S box, and we have different outputs. Now, for the 32 slit pairs, whenever we see the same input value, we expect to see the same output value independent of the S box. We don't know the S box, but the S box is deterministic. So it's going to be always the same. So when we say we check by observing the consistency of the ciphertext, we take the structure and we look whether in the, in the C part of the structure of the slit pair, and I'm using C and D, C is the, the short, the one from the top uh, slit pair, each time one of the 32 slit pairs has the same value in both, in, in, in two or more slit pairs, we expect to see the same value, corresponding value from the Ds in these uh, slit pairs. And this is why we can actually find the correct slit pair. This moves us to the next technique, which is the suggestive plain text structures. And as we mentioned before, one of the problem that we have is that in order to find a slit pair, we need, or more precisely, in order to verify that a pair is a slit pair, we need to check whether the key guess is correct. So most of the attacks try to do uh, tricks, as we saw before, in, instead of analyzing pairs, analyzing specific values. So we apply some transformation on all the plain text. We apply some transformation on all the ciphertext, and then we throw it, everything into a hash table and we try to do things efficiently. Now, in the case of uh, the suggestive plaintext structure, what we do, we do something slightly different, which is for a given plaintext, we, we associate or we build the data in such a way that once you try working or analyzing a given plaintext, you already have some suggestion regarding partial key information. So 
the idea is slightly different. Instead of doing some analysis to all the plain text and then some analysis to all the ciphertext and then trying to, to find the match, here, what we do, we put for each plain text, we do, we, we know that if this plain text is part of a slip pair, then we know something about the key. And then we iterate over the plain text and we already get partial key suggestions, which will be used for analyzing the slip pair. Now, an interesting uh, artifact of this approach is actually that we can get a success rate of one independent of the process, unlike uh, regular uh, slide attacks where you need uh, to, to hope that something will happen. There is, will be a collision, a birthday paradox collision, and this is not the case. So you attack a very simple 1K AES with success rate, rate of one, you pick two to the n over two plaintext such that their lower half is zero, and then you pick the QJs such that the upper half of this value, which is just P after the XOR is the key, is zero as well. So that means that if PI was encrypted to QJ, that means that the key, the uh, lower, lower, uh, sorry, the upper half of the key is actually equal to the upper half of PI. Because in order for PI to become QJ, we need the upper half of uh, PI to be uh, zero to become zero, so it will match QJ. Now, if this is the case, we know that there is a slip pair and we know information about the key. And this is related to uh, splice and cut. So if we take the attack by Baron et al from uh, 18 and add splice and cut, this is exactly what we get. Now, we're going to show how to use this attack in order to attack 1K AES with an incomplete diffusion in the last round, meaning, Let's assume for again for a second again that we're working with AES as AES, uh, and the last round lacks a mixed columns. So this time we need to pick two structures, QJ, one where we fix the upper half to zero and one where we fix it to one. And the reason for that is now the plain text P is going to have a counterpart part in this set, and there is going to be a friend, PIX or 0001, which, which will be encrypted to some QJ in the second uh, structure. And they're going to have to actually the same uh, values up to uh, this zero and one. So this actually generates two pairs immediately. And of course you can extract, you, you can expand this and generalize this to more pairs. Now, if this is the case, because we now have two pairs, so we can take CI and FI, which is the ciphertext of the friend of PI, and we get, uh, two values that enter the last incomplete diffusion uh, round and the same from the two QJs and we get some differential relation between the two which can be used to solve uh, the scheme and you have the full details in the paper. Now let's move on to the last attack which is a substitution slide attack and we're going to show it how it can be used to attack 1K AES even if the last round is has a completely different diffusion whether it's more or less, in the case of uh, this, the um, uh, suggestive uh, structure technique, we need it not to be the full diffusion, but in the substitution slide attack, it doesn't matter. It can be a different A prime last round. Uh, and the interesting part is that we need two to the n over two non plain texts, as I mentioned before. Now, because we don't have extra information, there is one slit pair with high probability. There is one slit pair, we need to identify it. And we are not allowed to try running a full a search of all possible pairs because there are two to the n of these. So how do we do that? Actually, this part is mostly algebra. Instead of, uh, we, we, we rewrite the key of a slit pair to be dependent PIX or something on PJ. This is Baron et al's standard transformation. And now we substitute the relations between the ciphertext, and you see that now the relations are complete, are significantly more complicated because the ciphertext CI has to be decrypted, then apply the inverse of the last round transformation, then uh, A, then K, S. It's, it's, a complete, it's a significantly harder transformation, but we can substitute all the key additions instead of K with this value. So this gives us a series of substitutions that ends with this equation. 
One side depends on PJ and CJ, and the other one on PI and CI, which is already a huge step forward in the sense that now we can do analysis for each side independently. There's only one tiny bit of a problem. As you can see, there's still key here. So we cannot build two tables independent of the key. So what we do, we do is slightly different. First of all, we evaluate one, one side, the bottom side, for all plain text. So we don't need to do it once. Then we guess n over four bits of the key. Now, by guessing these four, n over four bits of the key, we do two things. First of all, we are able to evaluate n over four uh, bits of pj because we can apply s to them. And then we can find whether pj is satisfying because we can always apply the inverse a fine transformation on PJ and we find whether they, they match. So we reduce automatically the number of candidates PJ to two to the N over four. But another thing that we do, which is independent of uh, the PIs, we can also go and evaluate this equation, again, N over four bits. Now we have N over four bits information from the plaintext side, n over four information from the substitution side. So we get n over two bits of filtering. So we immediately find the, the pj that corresponds to pi using hash tables. And once we have a suggestion, we can extract a key suggestion and again, verify it. So to conclude, we introduced four new slide techniques, the slit sets, the hypercube of slit pairs, suggestive plain text structures, and the substitution slides. And they are very useful for uh, substitution permutation networks and for other schemes as well. But the main uh, strength is the ability to, to withstand several changes in the last round uh, to the point that even if you have non-complete diffusion or different diffusion layers, or even just merely the XOR, you can still attack 2K AES and 3K AES. Here's a summary of the results in a very congested form. Um, I, I will just mention here that we worked on several uh, candidates. You can see in the paper, full is F is for full diffusion, uh, I is a, P is a partial, uh, T is for last round, which is not full round. And there are also some results in the case of the secret S box, where we don't have the, the previous work by Baron et al, who's uh, incorrect because it used slit chains to break um, uh, one. AES, 1K AES using uh, slit chains, but there are no slit chains in the case of SP networks, as I mentioned before. Thank you very much, and you're invited to see the full version.